couple of pictures this morning. Uh, pictures, and I'm going to ask you what you see, okay? I'm going to ask you what you see. The pictures. First one. <coughs> what do you see? Do you see a, a vase? Or do you see two faces? <laughs> Both are in the picture. Show you another one. What do you see? Seem like there is two different things. There's a face, and then uh, some people say that they see the word liar written. What do you see now? Here you see a uh, woman, and then another perspective is uh, a man playing the saxophone. In the case of these pictures, there is two ways of looking at them. Uh, you can see two different things depending on the perspective that you have. And in this case, it's not right or wrong either way you look at it. You can see a vase or faces. You can see a uh, saxophone player. You can see a woman's face. Nevertheless, there are many areas in life that it does matter how you look at things. There are right ways and there are wrong ways to look at things. When it comes to God, the Bible, and your spiritual life, there are wrong ways and there are right ways to look at things. Today, we will look at two examples in John chapter 5. Open your Bibles to John chapter 5. Two examples of people that looked at things the wrong way. Two examples of people that looked at things the wrong way. If you would, as you're turning there, please stand as we read the Word of God. Starting in verse 1, we'll read down to verse 16. <clears throat> After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that hath made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away. A multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, 
lest a worse thing come unto thee. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. You all may be seated. The first example of looking at things wrongly I'd like to look at is the man with the infirmity. As we go through these verses, start back at verse 1. After, there, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. So uh, throughout John, we see Jesus attending these feasts. Now, every time in the book of John, uh, John identifies the specific feast that Jesus was attending, but he does not hear. We are not sure what feast that is being attended, but we do know that there's a feast, that there is a large crowd, a great multitude of people in the city of Jerusalem, and Jesus was there for this feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there was, uh, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market or sheep gate, part of the gate and out the, the east side of the city, an outer gate called the sheep gate. You can go back to Nehemiah chapter 3 to get some information on this gate. But there was uh, by this gate a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. So this pool, and it was a rather large pool. Uh, if you look at the size of this room, it was even probably maybe bigger uh, than this room, the pool in itself. And there were five porches, the Bible tells us. Now, these porches were hallways with um, columns running down the side. So we had on one side a porch, a column, a hallway. On the other side of the pool... Another one. On this side, another one. On the back, another one. And then down the middle of this pool, you had one running. So you had all these hallways uh, in the midst of this large pool. And in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered. Waiting for the moving of the water. <clears throat> this is a place where the sick, where the injured, where the disease written people of the city would go. You can imagine the environment, the health hazards of this place. You know, it's estimated that there would be an average of 300 every day. People that could not help themselves. People disregarded by society. People that had no help, maybe had no family. But in times of the feast, in times of uh, feast time, festival time in Jerusalem, the number would have increased drastically. You have a pool in, uh, on the east side of the city with maybe upwards of one, two, three thousand sick and dying people waiting for the water to stir or the water to move. I want to point out something just by means of observation. Down in verse 6 it says, When Jesus saw him lie. So where do we find Jesus? Is he among the large crowds? Is he a, among the high and important people in the city? Where do we find him? We find him by the pool. We find Jesus among the people that are hurting. We find Jesus among the people that need help. Not only physically, but likely spiritually as well. That's where Jesus chose to spend His time. That's where Jesus chose to stroll. No, it was not a pretty environment. No, the environment was not um, a very good environment at all. But yet, that's where Jesus chose to be. He was seeking people in need. 
And I think we can learn from his example. Amen. We must not get too busy and caught up in our own world to forget that there are many sick and hurting people that need to be ministered to. Amen. Many that need you. Many that need to hear there is hope. Many that need to hear the spiritual truth that there is eternal hope for them. There are many around us, even in our city, that need to be ministered to. But how often do we walk around because of that environment? We see Jesus did not. Jesus was ministering to these people. Now, if we'll continue to read, we have these a great multitude laid around this pool waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Now let's stop there. Let's talk a little bit about uh, these verses. Let's talk a little bit about what is happening here there are a load, uh, quite a lot of different thoughts and textual variances of uh, verse 3b and 4, the moving of the waters and the angel. Now, many manuscripts even omit these verses, but they are included in the KJV and other translations that are translated from the received text. Most textual scholars have the opinion these verses were left out in the original text and included by scribes at a later time to explain verse uh, 7 discussing the troubling of the waters. Today, we're going to treat the text as it is before us in uh, the King James and preach it as originally included in the Gospel of John. Now, we come to another question. Was this an actual occurrence? Or a myth believed by the sick in Jerusalem? Was there actually an angel that came down and stirred the waters? And, uh, and, and, and just watched as the first one would go in and get healed? Or, uh, or was it a myth that maybe that was believed by the sick in Jerusalem? I'll give some thoughts and, and uh, then we can move on with this. So interpreting these verses in light of context in the rest of the Bible lends some to the idea that the troubling of the waters was a myth that was believed by these sick people in Jerusalem. The stirring of the water occurred by two springs that fed the pools. When there was large amounts of water coming through the springs, the waters would stir. We see the angel is not talked about again in this passage. And an angel coming down to mystically stir a pool in order to heal the first one that jumps in the pool, maybe seems inconsistent with how angels minister to people. It seems that angels like to minister per personally to people, one on one. It would seem like the angels were wanting some kind of competition among the people, that uh, the first one in was the only one that could be healed. Angels were created by God and under His direct control. And how the angels trouble the water seems inconsistent, maybe, with how God would deal with man according to the Scriptures. Maybe these verses are descriptive, not prescriptive. They could be explaining what the people believed, but not teaching us this was a real occurrence. But... In verse 4, the text does not tell us that it was a myth. The text does not lend itself that it was believed. The text says, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whatsoever then the first ha after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. John lays out the facts as if it's an historical fact. John does not say that it was believed or that it was not true, and he never even contradicts that. He just asks, says, for an angel does this. I wanted to present you with the facts this morning concerning these verses in order for you, through prayer and proper biblical consideration, 
conclude on your own. And I present the text as it's written this morning. It says, For an angel went down at certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever then after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. So I want to point out a couple things about these people in verses 3 and 4 if you don't mind. These people were desperate for any kind of help that they could get. They had likely exhausted all, all other options. There were no other options for them. They were physically sick and there seemed to be no other hope for them but the stirring of the waters. That is why they were there in hopes that maybe they could be healed of whatever disease that they had. The sick people, they spent most of their life there hoping that they could catch the water stirring and that they would be the first ones in. That was what their whole day was centered around. Maybe their whole night waiting for the stirring of these waters. They may, may have disregarded everything else in their life. They may have disregarded their spiritual needs just to see if they can be healed of the infirmity they have. The first thing I want to implore you to this morning, and we're going to talk, f trying to treat your physical needs is important and should be done, but do not neglect your spiritual needs. Amen? Do not neglect the spiritual needs that you have in your life. Don't chase, don't spend your life chasing the physical desires of life and neglect the spiritual healing that you need. More important than your physical healing is your need of spiritual healing. Now, again, don't get me wrong. The need for physical health and healing of infirmities, it's important. It should be sought after even with intensity. But in the process, don't forget your spiritual needs and your spiritual health. And when seeking these physical things, when seeking healing, when seeking health, don't forget the power of prayer. Don't forget. To talk to God. Amen. Now. The point again. More important than your physical. Is your spiritual. Let me ask you a question. Very important. Have you been saved? Have you trusted in the Lord Jesus. To save you from your lost state? That is a spiritual need. That you have this physical body and this life are temporary right no matter what disease might come to me no matter what my health issues i am going to die one day right some sooner than others but the fact is our bodies wither right and we die this life is like a vapor it is a short time we can spend our life con con uh, worried about the physical we must understand the reality that our bodies will wither away and we will be buried one day but yet when we die then eternity starts amen and we will either be what eternally in heaven with the lord or eternally separated from God in hell. Eternity starts when we die. Where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? Continue reading verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. Now, what infirmity did this man have? I don't know. And the Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, it seems to lend the fact that he was very weak that he could not walk to the pool. He wasn't very fast. Uh, maybe he was paralyzed. Uh, but it does not tell us. It just says he has an infirmity, one that's keeping him from being able to make it to the pool first. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had now been a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole Jesus is down with these people he points out one man Jesus is God 
He knows the, the length of time. He knows everything uh, that is happening with each one. And he knows this man has been in this state for 38 years. Maybe longer than uh, most of the people that had even been alive that was there. The text lends the idea that the man was old at this time. So Jesus, knowing that he had had this for a long time, he asked the man a question, Will thou be made whole? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed from your infirmity? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. All right, let's make a couple of points on these verses. Number one, Jesus cared about the state of the man and had compassion on him, okay? No matter what's going on in your life, it might be a physical infirmity. It might be health issues that you're having. Let me tell you, the Lord cares. Amen? The Lord cares about people. This man, as we will see, didn't even put his faith in Christ. He didn't even have faith. But yet, Jesus healed him. Jesus deeply and intimately cares about your needs. And if you are his child, if you are a child of God, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, he can walk with you every step of the way and give you the peace and the hope that you so desperately need. Amen? He'll give it to you. We're going to see this world won't. The Lord will. That's the first thing I see here. Jesus cared. Jesus had compassion on this man. He says, do you want to be healed? And then he asked, do you want to be made whole? I think the question Jesus asked is twofold. I think that uh, Jesus is asking physically and spiritually, but I don't think the man understands that. Uh, Jesus says, do you want to be made whole? Uh, I think it's spiritual because one, Jesus came to seek and to save those who were lost. The Son of God looks at the man in the eyes and says, do you want to be made whole? He asked the man a question and we're going to see the man's heart and the reaction of the man. Of course the man wanted to be healed physically, right? He was at the pool. He had been there for a long time. Of course he wanted to be healed. Of course he wanted to walk again. But the man did not understand that he needed to be made spiritually whole as well. And I want to ask you that question. Do you understand? Have you come to the realization that you need to be made spiritually whole as well this morning? We see the response of the man. You know, and I don't know how you look at his response in verse 7. We'll read it again, but... I view it as kind of a bitterness of the man. Look at 7. The impotent man answered him. He didn't say yes. He didn't say hell. He says, I have, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. The man with the infirmity was likely bitter, tired, and had given up. So the, I've never made it. Nobody wants to help me. Uh, uh, everybody beats me to the pool. I, I will never make it. The man had no idea who was standing before him and who had asked him the question. Jesus was surely trying to spark a conversation with him, lead it in a spiritual direction, but the man was not open for, for talking. The man was open for complaining. I have no, it, it's never worked out. 38 years I have been in this condition. Let me apply this to your life. Listen, maybe you are in the same place as this man today. You are bitter, you are tired, and you've given up on life. You've laid there and you've tried day after day after day, week after week, year after year, seeking, but yet nothing. You are broken 
and you have been for a long time. You've tried everything for help. You've looked in every direction. You've given it your best effort. But you never make it to the pull in time. You have no help. And you've had no success. Maybe you have even stopped trying and putting any effort in to better yourself or the situation because you have had no success in the past. You say, why even try any longer? Why even put forth the effort for the glory of God? Why even take another step? Let me just live through life coasting. Maybe Jesus is asking you the question this morning. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made whole? There is a hole and there is an emptiness in each one of us that only God can fill. We seek, we search, and we try to fill it with ourselves. We try to fill it with other things, but it never works. Like the woman at the well, Jesus quenched her thirst. Will you allow Him to quench yours? Jesus is the bread of life. Will you allow Him to fill your hunger, your need in your life? I know you are tired. I know you are wearied and worn. But come to Jesus and allow Him to make you whole today. You've tried everything else. Now try the Lord. you've never been saved come to know him as savior today and if you are saved it's time to commit to him and his word allow his way to help you get back to where you need to be you've tried everything else try the lord allow him to make you whole his way i want to point something else out here in verse 6 and 7, about these people, about this man wanting to be made whole by the pool. Guys, it is not the pool of this world that can help you, but Jesus Christ. You see everyone else, I want you to picture this. You see everyone else seeking the ways of the world to help them. They surround the pool of the world and they race to get in first. You have been following the examples of everyone else around you. And where has that gotten you? Nowhere. The man had been down with everybody else, had been seeking the same thing everybody else had as he surrounded the pool, and he did this for 38 years and he had gotten nowhere. He had not moved. He had not been made whole. The man had been looking in the wrong places. Maybe you have been looking in the wrong places for your life as well. You still gather with the same people day after day and no one has been healed. You're all just waiting for something else to happen, for some luck to turn your life around. I say it is time to turn to Jesus, to turn to His Word and allow Him to turn your life around. The pull of the world promises a quick fix. Get here first, jump in, and all your problems will be done away. Now, your salvation, that happens instantaneously. That is a quick fix. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He did the work on the cross. Trust in Him to save you. But if you are saved, turning your life around the right direction, it's a process. Amen? It's a process. It's not just to jump in the pool and everything's okay. I'll make one little commit. I'll do this and then everything. No, it's a process, guys. It takes time. It takes commitment. It takes sacrifice. It takes surrender. It takes dedication. If you're going to come to the Lord and allow Him to fix your life. Amen? And to make you whole. It's worth it. And it is needed. But it will require your commitment to the Lord. 
Will you allow the Lord to take the reins of your life today and make you whole? Let's continue to read our text. Verse 8. He says, do you want to be made whole? The man says, I can't. Uh, everybody gets there for me. Jesus saith unto him, rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. The man was completely healed at the words of Jesus. Jesus spoke and the man was healed. Jesus did not halfway heal the man, but completely. Now let me uh, point out the extent of this miracle. If a man has not been able to walk for 38 years what is the condition of his legs in? How much muscle do you think he has left? <laughs> How much muscle memory do you think he has left? None, right? But yet, at the words of Jesus, rise, take up thy bed and walk, he gets up like he had been walking yesterday. He gets up and somehow the muscles in his legs were miraculously restored. He understood how to walk. He rolls up his mat. He puts his mat on his shoulder and he walks. The man that had an encounter with the Son of God. <laughs> the Messiah. The Savior of the world. God manifested in the flesh. The man had been in the presence of of God. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, <laughs> He says, well, Hold on, man. You're carrying your mat. This is the Sabbath day. This is a holy day. You can't do that. It's not lawful for you. So the man answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Somebody else told me to. He healed me and he told me to walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? Who was it? What's their name? What's his name? And he that was healed wist not who it was. Didn't know who it was. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. What does that verse tell us? The man had no idea who Jesus was at that time. I mean, no idea, right? The man had accepted the healing and moved on with his life. The man did not place faith in Jesus. And we see this throughout the New Testament. Jesus healed people despite their lack of faith and knowledge of him as the Son of God. He just accepted it, went on with his life. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So Jesus has left the pool. He now finds the man in the temple, approaches the man, and surely knows the conversation that the man's having with the Pharisees. Goes to the man and says, You have been made whole. Okay. Now sin no more unless a worse thing happen to you. So the man's found in the temple, right? This place he was not able to go before. All his Jewish friends were there, but now he's been healed. He would have been disregarded before, but now he can go to the temple. And I don't know how genuine his temple presence is, if he's trying to truly worship God or not, but from his heart we know that he doesn't have faith in Christ. And then Jesus makes an interesting remark in 14 that I want to take just a minute to address. He says, Behold, thou art made whole. He says, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So now the man's officially introduced to Jesus. Who Jesus is. Or at least his name. And some would indicate that this verse uh, shows that the infirmity that the man had for 38 years was the result of sin. Just take a moment to cover a few things there. One, sickness is not always the result of a specific sin in life, okay? John 11, 4 says this. When Jesus heard that, he said... 
This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. We see some sickness is that God may receive glory from it. Now, sometimes sickness is the result of sin. In the case of the first Corinthians, uh, in First Corinthians, the Corinthians were observing the Lord's Supper wrong, and it says that many were sick, and some have even died. We see First John five: there is a sin unto death. We see the words of David in Psalm thirty-two three: when I can, when I refused to confess my sin, my whole body wasted away while I groaned in pain all the day long. But ultimately, all sickness is the result of the curse of sin. When sin entered the world through Adam, sickness and death entered the world as well. And all sickness ultimately came from the result of that curse of sin when death entered. So what's the case for this man, you may ask? How about this man? Was it because he sinned that he was in this, had this infirmity? Well, I don't know why he had this infirmity, but I do know that Jesus says sin no more unless something worse happens to you. Now, maybe Jesus is talking about his physical infirmity. Maybe he's saying if, if, you, if you're going to continue to sin, then you're going to be way sicker and way worse next time. But I, here's what I think Jesus is telling him. You ready? I think Jesus is telling him this. Go and sin no more. And that sin was his unbelief. That sin was his lack of faith in Jesus as the Son of God. And he says, go sin no more lest something worse happen to thee. And what do you think that something worse was and is? Separation from God eternally in hell. He says, stop your unbelief now. Trust in me as Lord and Savior. Repent of your sin. Lest you die and be separated from God. Go sin no more. Lest something worse happen unto thee. Will you turn from your sin of unbelief? And placed your trust in the Lord today. Verse 15 and 16. The man with the infirmity. Looking at the wrong things. Jesus had just looked at him. Go sin no more. Lest something else worse happens to me. And the text indicates the next thing he did. Was go straight to the Pharisees. And tell them it was that man that healed me. The man departed. And told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. And sought to slay him. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. The man diverted the blame away from him. <laughs> I know I was walking on the Sabbath. But how about look at the man who told me to. Jesus says sin no more. He leaves and automatically points Jesus out to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees sought from that day, it says, to kill him. It is at this point in our text in John that the Pharisees now have a motive to persecute and kill the Son of God and ultimately would try him illegally and crucify him on the cross. Of course, he gave his own life for you and for me. To die for our sins. The man was obviously not concerned about Jesus' statement or about the well-being. He was, just consent. he was concerned about his own agenda. He was concerned about his own well-being. I want to point one more thing out here and I think this is significant. Jesus Christ had spoken to him. He had given him spiritual advice, important advice. He said, go and sin no more lest something else worse happen to you. But how often do we hear God's word? Do we hear direct instruction from God and disregard it immediately in our lives? We hear it. We know we need to do something. But yet, we choose to ignore it. It goes in one ear and out the other. How often do we do this when we hear the word of God preached in our life? 
Jesus tells us something important. God has spoken. But then we choose to continue with our own, aden- our, our own agenda. Worry about our own lives. We must heed to the word of God. The man with the infirmity was looking at the wrong things in his life. Even after he was healed, he continued to look and worry about other things in his life. And we must learn from his example. Make sure we are not looking at the wrong things. We are not looking at things the wrong way. But we are looking to Jesus Christ, his word and his will for our life. Take about two minutes and look at the Pharisees. And it's obvious what they were looking at wrongly. They were concerned about the Sabbath day. A man had just been healed from 38 years, had had his mat and was walking and said, I have been made whole. And they did not praise God. They weren't concerned about him, his healing. No, they were concerned about him walking and carrying a bed on the Sabbath day. They were heaped in religion. They were heaped in man-made laws, in man-made rules. <laughs> they were worried about him breaking rules. Not obeying a law and a rule that they had set. They held tightly to the Old Testament law. Added quite a few laws of their own on top of those (coughs) that God gave. They were legalists. And they missed the point. They said, that's fine. Now who did it? Who told you about that? Who told you? Who healed you? Who told you and thought that they had the authority to tell you to walk on this holy day? And he, this man said Jesus. They were concerned about crucifying Jesus, the Son of God. They were definitely looking at the wrong things. They missed the point that a man had been miraculously healed. They missed the point. That Jesus Christ, the Savior, the one that had healed the man, was the only one that could heal them from their sin. They were looking at things wrong, heaped in legalism. Do not get caught up in legalism, guys. Do not get caught up in rules made by man and religion and by looking at things wrong. Do not allow yourself to become blinded to God's perfect will and His perfect purpose because you cannot see over man-made regulations. Allow yourself to be guided by Scripture and the Holy Spirit of God, nothing more and nothing less. I'm going to close this sermon this morning. And I'm going to close it at the real point of this whole text. The real reason Jesus chose to heal this man. The reason that John has recorded it for us. We all stand very quietly. Our musicians come forward. Our song leader. John tells us His purpose for writing his gospel in John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. Here's the reason John has recorded this sign in this miracle for us. You ready? And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in His name. These are written that you may have life, that you may have eternal life, that you might understand and come to realize that this was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who healed the man. You are told about this miracle that Jesus performed that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus that turned water into wine in John 2 can make a transformation in your life. 
Jesus instantly healed a nobleman's son that we looked at last week from a miles away, and he can heal your sickness of sin today. Jesus healed a man that had an infirmity for 38 years, and he can heal your spiritual infirmity today, no matter how long you have been neglecting him. Jesus is the Son of God. He revealed that through the many signs we see in the book of John. Has God revealed to you this morning through the Holy Spirit that Jesus Christ is in fact the Son of God and the one who can save you from your sins? Have you come to realize that you're a sinner in need in salvation from that sin? The only way to be saved is through Jesus. No works of your own. Will you place your trust in Christ today? And lastly, maybe you already have done that. You're saved, but yet you've been looking all the wrong places in your life, Christian, for happiness, for joy, for peace, and for answers. You've been following the example of the world and everybody else, and you have been laying there unable to get the fulfillment you so need and desire Allow Jesus to fill your thirst, to fulfill your hunger today. Will you come to him? This invitation's for you. I've given it to God. Will you give it to God?